Hello, everyone. So this is a supplement uh, tutorial to the lab to GIS problem solving tutorial, um, where I want to talk a little bit more about geo processing, I guess, inside of raster uh, data set. So basically getting raster data into these polygon data. So we worked a lot last time with the basin watersheds in Massachusetts, and we used this raster data set, which is topography. Um, topography being a continuous data set going from, you know, sea level up to whatever the highest peak is in Western Massachusetts. Um, and in order to summarize inside of the watersheds, we used that zonal statistics as table tool because that gives us basic statistics like the average elevation, minimum, maximum, standard deviation, what have you, in terms of uh, these continuous variables. Um, so that's one common type of raster data set, a continuous raster data set where you're going from low to high values like elevation, or if you had you know, distance to coastline or distance to road or something like that, um, that might also be another good example of a continuous data set in raster land. But the other main type of raster data set that we often see is a categorical raster data set. So in this case, this is the National Land Cover data set from 2016. It is made up also, just like <laughs> any other raster data set, made up of pixels. We can zoom in a little bit just so you can start seeing a kind of pixel articulation going on in here. This particular image file, which is a, um, a raster file that comes up out of a uh, software called Erdas Imagine, so it's a IMG, but most software that deal with raster grids are pretty good at reading stuff from various different places. Um, so this particular data set also has embedded in it um, definitions for what the colors should look like, which is why you see all these nice colors that look reasonable and somebody in terms of cartography has thought a fair bit about what to do um, for rivers, you know, or blue, urban areas are in kind of red, agriculture is in this kind of brown, forests are in this kind of green and shrubland, scrubland are in the kind of yellowy color. Um, all of these though, if we actually, um, you know, clicked on one of these pixels, we would get a value of 41 in this case for that forest patch or 11 for this area of water, um, 23 for that area of urban land cover. So it's still a raster data set. It's made up of integer values that have meaning in terms of a categorical land cover class. We can open this up and just kind of like see. So this is the way that they've categorized it. You know, so 11 and 12 have some color, 21 to 24, some color, et cetera. If we want to know what those are, we can go to the metadata file, this XML document. And you guys have that for your smaller NLCD um, clipped layer. And that is showing up on my other screen. So let me just find it. And this is what it looks like or should look like when you open that XML document, it gives you information about you know, who created the data, if you want a citation for um, going and reading about how it was created abstract. And since we've got all these numbers that correspond to land cover, we should be able to find eventually as we scroll down in here, information, okay, here it is, on what these land cover class codes mean. So 11 means open water, 12 means perennial ice and snow, 21 means developed, etc. down to the bottom of this. Um, if you took the average within this watershed land cover, you would just end up with some numeric average that was a combination of, you know, the forest codes and the urban codes and whatever else, right? That would not be a meaningful number for you because those numbers don't actually have real meaning. They're just stand-ins for text. 
So the question here is, all right, what if I wanted to find out within this watershed what my percentage of forest was or my percentage of urban area was within that watershed? How do I do that? So that's what we're going to do. Um, so the first thing that we need to think about is, OK, what do we actually want to classify here? Um, and I'm going to go with urban areas or developed lands, which I looked up before, but we can look again. There are actually four categories of developed lands. So number 21, uh, developed mix, mixed with open space, 22 low intensity, 23 medium, and 24 high. So basically anything between 21 and 24 can be considered as some form of developed land in this, uh, in this raster grid. Um, so let's zoom out to the full extent of our watersheds. If we wanted to calculate within any one of these watersheds, what is the percentage of developed land of any of those four classes, developed land within the, this watershed? In order to do that, we would need a separate file, basically, that just has the area uh, of developed land and all other lands. And the easiest way to do that is to think about this as a binary file. So basically, you've got ones and zeros. And all of your ones, you want to be any of those categories of developed land. And all of your zeros, you want to be everything else. And the reason that ones and zeros are really nice from a <laughs> summary perspective or from a math perspective is if you have a binary one in ones and zeros within each of these watersheds, then if you use that zonal statistics as table, you can calculate the average of all those ones and zeros, and it will give you essentially the fraction of developed land within that watershed, right? So if you have 50 ones, 50 pixels with a value of one, you've got 50 developed pixels and you've got 50 pixels with a value of zero undeveloped pixels. You average those together. If the, the half of them are ones and half of them are zeros, then you should get an average of 0.5, right? Because I have averaged together 50 values of one and 50 values of zero to get 0.5. And 0.5 tells me that half, 50 out of 100, of the pixels in that watershed are developed land. So that's where we're headed. Let's go ahead and do that. All right, so first thing I need to do is to go find my geoprocessing window because all I've got is catalog up here. Um, so here is my geoprocessing window and I've already helpfully put in because I was testing this before, a uh, raster calculator. So here is my raster calculator. All right, so recall that our developed land were values between 21 and 24. So what I want is values that are greater than or equal to 21 and less than or equal to 24. And I want to make sure I use an and in between those because if I use or, then I get all values back. Basically, you could be above 21 or below 24, which means you can be anything from zero to infinity, essentially, or negative infinity to infinity. All right. I also had to play around a little bit to remind myself that you need a parentheses to start with. So parentheses that is going to be greater than or equal to 21. We want our little ampersand, another parentheses, that thing will be less than or equal to 24. Okay. Um, I was playing around a little bit this I, with this. I started out just trying to export a new image file or a geotiff from this and Arc Pro was giving me pain <laughs> with that. Um, this It works totally fine, I think, in ArcGIS Desktop to export this as a GeoTIFF into your folder. Um, Arc Pro was only allowing me to do it inside of a GeoDatabase. So you can see that I already made a temp file here. Um, 
but I want this to be developed land. So I'm just gonna save it as that. This is generally a good rule, whether you're an Arc desktop or Arc Pro, that if you start getting weird um, error messages that you can't easily resolve by, with a search, try saving whatever that file is inside of a geodatabase. Sometimes that just makes Arc happier <laughs> to do that. Um, the other thing I did in here, uh, so it's probably saved because I did this last time, is to change the processing extent to just be my basin study area because I don't need, you know, this is actually national with kind of a weird projection because we're looking at it in, in Mass State Plain right now. I only need the Massachusetts part because I just care about the basins. For your lab report, I've already clipped out a chunk that's just Western Mass, so you don't have to worry about this part too much. But um, generally, if you don't need a giant database, don't have a giant <laughs> database. All right, so let's see if this will go. Okay, so that didn't actually take too long. It probably took about 30 seconds on my machine, so it should be pretty, you know, reasonably fast, hopefully on yours too. All right, so now what we're looking at is basically a binary layer where all of the ones on here, in this case, this purple color, are um, developed land. Makes, you know, this looks reasonable like that because you can sort of see the roads and stuff like that and all of the zeros are undeveloped land. So there's a zero, there's a one. Now we are back in business as far as the analysis goes because we actually have numeric values that are meaningful here. So now we can use our zonal statistics as table. Um, and we want, just like we did with the um, topography, our input is gonna be our basin study area. Our zone field is our name of that basin study area. We are going to input our developed land. Um, we can output, let's call this basin developed. Um, let's just grab all statistics types. And off we go. So let's check this out. So we still have our same 182 names of the different basins, um, along with other stuff associated with them. The important one here, though, is the mean, um, because mean in this case refers to essentially the fraction that is developed within that basin. Um, if we want it to be percentage, <laughs> we need to remember to multiply this by 100, right? Because it's out of one at this point. So let us, let us visualize. That looks like. Open this guy up. I've now got my mean value over here. Just like I would have done or did do in the last tutorial, um, if I wanted to keep these data in here, I would add a field and I would call it something like percent developed or something like that. And then I would use the field calculator to copy this over multiplying it by 100 if I had called it percent developed. But for now, just because uh, we're not as, um, uh, wait, what do I want? The symbology. I'm still getting used to this thing. All right, so here's where we wanted to get to. Primary symbology so that we have graduated colors. 
I'm going to use the field of mean. In this case, mean refers to um, the percent developed or a fraction developed. And maybe I'll use that sort of like red, I want some sort of red scheme to indicate the areas that are more developed um, versus less developed. Finally figured out how to minimize this a little bit. So let us zoom to this layer. And this shouldn't surprise you based on everything else that we've done, but the more developed watersheds with more urban area in them are in the eastern part of the state, and then we move over to less developed in the western part of the state, although we've still got some at the you know, lower end of, of the Cape um, that are less developed too. So anytime you're working with categorical data and want to summarize your categor categorical data within a polygon, uh, it's easiest if you first export that categorical data so that you're basically one, zero, true, false, um, where ones are the areas where that land cover is true and zeros are the area where that land cover is false. Um, super hope that's helpful in terms of making progress on your lab reports and I will see you in class.